So I'd like to begin our time today just uh, in a moment of prayer. Uh, many of you are aware that uh, there's been a, a family, uh, not necessarily in our church family, but their brothers and sisters in Christ that uh, just had a great loss this last week as their daughter was killed at the beach uh, in a real uh, difficult setting and accident there in the sand. Uh, their last name were the Franks. And we just need to be praying for them. God's word says when one, body, one piece or one part of the body hurts, everybody hurts, right? And so there's great hurt in that family. And so as we pray, we just want to pray that God would uh, show up in amazing ways for them to sustain them and carry them through. We want to pray for Tim and Colleen Schweitzer, part of our church family. They're very good friends with the Franks, that they can minister well, as well as their church family. So let's pray together right now. Father, we do come before you because we have brothers and sisters uh, that hurt and are grieving. And we just pray, Lord, that even today that you would uh, just wrap them up. Lord, even that last song, that they would run into your arms and that you would sustain them and meet them. And Lord, that you would do more than just get them through, that you would just cause them to even bring you great glory and praise in the midst of, um, no doubt, Lord, from all of our perspectives, just a terrible loss. Lord Jesus, we know that you're always enough. And this is when we uh, just desire for our brothers and sisters to experience that. Lord, for all the others around them that are very close, Tim and Colleen and, and others in their church family that Lord, you would speak truth and extend your grace and just be, uh, just bring the hugs and the words of assurance that would be appropriate and helpful. Lord, as we spend this time here today, I pray that you would uh, also meet with us here, all the other church families that are meeting, that you would, Jesus, be the center, that your word would speak with authority as the Holy Spirit teaches us today. We pray all of this because of Jesus. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, some of our Tibetan Outreach Team members went up to uh, Cooper Spur up on Mount Hood. How many of you have been up there? It's a beautiful area, just uh, almost goes right up to the top of Mount Hood. We went up there to try to prepare for our time together uh, in Ladakh. It was just wonderful to be up high. Don't you love being up high above everything? Uh, it was a couple of years ago now, our family took a trip up to Seattle, and as many as years as I've been in the Northwest, I've never been to the top of the Space Needle. How many of you have been there? Yeah, yeah. It's beautiful up there just, just to see it. What I liked about that setting is you can look down and you can see the roads kind of from the beginning to the end and everything in between. As I thought about that particular setting, I thought about our time today in Isaiah because we're bringing our time to Isaiah to a close and we're going to be up high and we're going to see some themes that have been flowing through this book from the beginning to the end. We're going to see the end. He actually ends in a very unique way as he looks to what is yet future. And what we're going to see today are some important principles that guide us as we live our lives. Again, as I think about that time on the Space Needle, we were there and you could see all the roads and all the traffic in Seattle, but you just couldn't stay up there and look at it. You had to actually go down, and then we had to get into the traffic, and we had to get back to Portland, and, and that's really what we want to experience today, that being up high and seeing things, but then having what we need as we go down and live life, because we don't stay up, do we? We, we need to come down. We need to live in the reality of what life is all about. So some have called the book of Isaiah uh, the mini Bible because it has 66 chapters, just as the Bible has 66 books. It's interesting that it's actually divided, uh, the book of Isaiah, uh, much like the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, with a break at chapter 39 moving into some different areas. And so as we look at this chapter, chapter 66, it could be compared as to looking at the whole book of Revelation, and we see God's beautiful plan as it's summed up. 
So with those thoughts in mind, let's jump right into Isaiah chapter 66. We have five uh, very clear principles that surface as we go through this. First of all, we see in verses 1 and 2 the position of the God that we worship today. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where then is a house you could build for me and where is a place that I may rest? For my hand made all these things, thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord. So the first thing we see as we move to an end here is maybe the most important principle that we can see is the exalted position of the Lord that we worship. God is speaking through Isaiah, and as he brings to the end of this message, he says, here's what I want you to know. I want you to recognize my position in the universe. God is in the ultimate controlling position in the universe. And Isaiah speaks of that in a very beautiful way. Now, he could have just said God is great, God is exalted, God is sovereign, God is powerful, all of which is true, but he says it in a very beautiful way. He says God's throne is heaven. God's footstool is earth. And so in that very beautiful way, the prophet is revealing that God is beyond us and above us, and around us, and we don't control him. He's not dependent on us. He's not controlled by us. He's not captured by us. Those images reveal that God cannot be placed in a box. There are not words that we could use, that anybody that could use that would really capture the essence of who God is. And while we have the whole Bible that is telling us about God, even that for our finite minds to grasp God is not enough. It is very clear as we bring this to an end that God through Isaiah wants his people to know that he is not limited, he cannot be defined, and he cannot be controlled. And he doesn't want them to think that even building a structure would be enough to somehow contain God. So you see those verses there, where then is a house you could build for me? See, the people that first heard these words had seen the destruction of the temple, and they anticipated someday the rebuilding of a temple, and as important as the temple was in the plan and purposes of God, the temple did not contain God. God could never be contained in a structure. And what's interesting is we go back to the building of the temple. Solomon, who was the primary builder of that, recognized that. Now that temple, it's interesting, Solomon's temple, some amazing stats as we look at all the details in Scripture, it took nearly 200,000 workers over seven years to build. It was a staggering structure. Hand-cut stones, hand-cut timbers, all of it overlaid by hammered gold. It would rival the beauty of any structure built today, but did God live in that temple? He didn't live there in the sense that his fullness was there. His glory was manifest in that place. But the temple did not hold God. And what's interesting is Solomon recognized that even in the building of it. So at the dedication of this beautiful temple, here's what Solomon prays, or at least part of it, in 1 Kings chapter 8. It says, Heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house which I have built. So Solomon understood that this house that he was to build was not going to contain God, but was going to be a place where the people could experience the glory of God in a very beautiful way. Solomon understood that, but as we look at Isaiah's words, I'm wondering if the people in Isaiah's time had kind of lost sight of that. Did they understand the immensity of God, the vastness of God? Did they understand that they could not capture God or own God in some way? That they were indeed his chosen people, and we'll see that in just a moment, 
but they did not have a corner on the market of God. Now, there's a real important lesson for us, church, in that. How big is your God? How immense, how vast, how unsearchable is your God? I wonder if oftentimes we are guilty of shrinking God down to a tame and manageable being. I wonder if we're guilty at times of putting God in our theological box, thinking that we have him all figured out. I wonder if we have determined that we understand how God acts and why God acts and what will motivate him to act. I wonder if we become even sectarian in a way, thinking that our type of worship, our type of the way we look to God and pursue God is really the only way that God ever responds to. You know, it's been wonderful for me to be a part of these Tibetan outreach teams trips because when we go to India, they don't do church the same. And it's beautiful. And it's unlike anything that we experience. See, we've not somehow captured God in what we're doing here today. I wonder sometimes also if this limiting of God allows, or it, 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 it takes us to Scripture, and sometimes we even ignore passages that speak about God in ways that really make us uncomfortable. Do you ever read Scripture sometime, and you read what God did, and you, you almost want to close the book and say, I'm not liking that. I'm not comfortable with what he did there. I'm not comfortable with how God presents himself there. And sometimes we tend to water down passages because they just make us feel almost unsafe with God. Really, have you ever felt that way? Just a little bit unsafe when you read something in Scripture about what he did or, or how he responded in a certain situation? I'm even wondering, as I ponder that, if part of that is the reason why Aaron built that beautiful calf. Remember in the Old Testament? God was present, was he not? But God was the fire on the mountain. But they wanted something more manageable, something more moldable, something more, something safer. See, the fire on the mountain was big and massive and out of their control. So they create a, a, a calf, a golden calf, something that they could make, right? Something that they could mold something that they could move where they needed it because God was bigger than they could really grasp. It's important that as we learn to live life as God intended us to live life that God stay really, really big, really beyond us, really vast, It was St. Augustine who said this, God is not what you imagine or what you think you understand, and if you understand, you failed. When we think we understand him, then we haven't understood him. And I don't know, for some of us, that feels really uncomfortable because we just want to understand God and, and control God and, and make God do things that we want him to do, kind of like you just rub the genie bottle a little bit and here comes God, right? That's not God. So principle number one is we learn to live life and, and experience God in his fullness is to let God stay really, really big. And when we read those passages in the scripture and we say, I don't get it, say, that's okay. I don't get this. And yet as God continues to work with us, we understand little tidbits here and there about the vastness of this God that we have the privilege of being in relationship with. So we see the position of our God. The next thing we see in this passage is the passion of our God. And we think, when you think of the word passion, passion goes both ways. I can be passionate for something, and I can be passionate against something. I'm passionate against tomatoes. 
I, I despise fresh tomatoes. If I ever come to your house to eat and you put a tomato in front of me, I'll say, thanks, but no thanks. That's not even in my notes. I don't even know where that came from there. <laughs> so I, I, I guess I said that because God in this passage reveals what he's passionate for and what he's passionate against. So verse 2 says this, this is, but to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. But he who kills an ox is like one who slays a man, and he who sacrifices a lamb is like one who breaks a dog's neck. He who offers a grain offering is like one who offers swine's blood. He who burns incense is like the one who blesses an idol. As they have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations, so I will choose their punishments, and I will bring on them what they dread. Because I called, but no one answered. I spoke, but they did not listen, and they did evil in my sight and chose that in which I did not delight. Here's what that reveals. God is passionate and in pursuit of a particular type of person. The text actually says he looks to this person, and that word means he looks intently. He, he looks in favor of a particular type of person, and it's really clear in this text. It's the person who is humble and contrite of spirit who trembles at the word of God. Let's just camp here a little bit. The humble person. The King James Version would translate that as the poor person, but not in a reference to being poor financially, but instead the person who recognizes their own spiritual poverty before God. Remember, it was Jesus who said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. See, our natural tendency is to raise man up and to lower God down is to raise the status of a person up and move God down. And, and so we see in the very beginning, Isaiah says it's just the opposite. We raise God up and we move man down to that very appropriate position. God looks. God is passionate to see a person who sees their need for him, who's humble enough to say, I can't, and humble enough to say I need and humble enough to say God this is who I am and I'm not enough God is passionate about the person who is contrite of spirit interesting word contrite it's only used one other time in the Old Testament and it's used as a reference to being maimed or crippled it's the person that recognizes that spiritually they are crippled spiritually they're not where they need to be. Spiritually, they're maimed. This is the person who sees themselves spiritually accurately from God's point of view. Their spirit is maimed and broken and in need of healing. And as you search the pages of Scripture, you see many examples of this type of humility, this type of spiritual understanding but also you see many examples of pride and arrogance. And, and, and as you go through Scripture, it becomes very clear. God is for those who are humble and contrite in spirit, and he is always against those who are boastful and arrogant. I've always been amazed at the Apostle Paul. Uh, amazing man in the spiritual realm in the sense that uh, most of the New Testament most of the doctrine, most of the truth that God felt the church needed to know was given to the Apostle Paul as he wrote letters. It's an amazing thing that the Apostle Paul was asked to do. And as you think of the amazing thing that the Apostle Paul was asked to do, it's amazing to see how he saw himself. Look at these statements made by the Apostle Paul. He says, I am the least of the apostles. I am the very least of the saints. And then he says, I am the foremost of sinners. And as you look at when each of those statements were made, they're, they're 1 Corinthians and Ephesians and Timothy, as we understand when they were written, it's almost like the older he gets, the lower he gets. Because he starts, I'm the least of the apostles, 
And this says, no, really, I'm the least of all the believers. And no, really, I'm just the worst of all sinners. Do you see where he goes? He goes down. In this amazing position that he was placed in to be the channel of the truth of God, he keeps going down in his view of himself. I would say that's a person that's contrite of spirit. He recognizes he recognizes his limitations. He recognizes his frailties. So we have a person that's humble. We have a person that's contrite of spirit. God is passionate for those people. And then it says, this person who trembles at God's word. For the people in Isaiah's time, God's word was primarily the word that came through the prophets. God was looking for people who would not just listen to what the prophet said, but then respond to what the prophet said and even tremble at what the prophet said as it was the word of God. It's important to remember that God does not just like to hear himself talk. God just wasn't bored and thought he would communicate some truth in a book. God speaks his word so that people would know it and respond to it and even tremble at his truth. There's an amazing story in 2 Kings 22. And it's wonderful to read those history books and how all the different kings responded. In 2 Kings 22, there's a young king named Josiah. He was one of the good kings and before him were a bunch of bad kings and as he comes to reign as a very young man, one of the first things he does, he says, we need to get the temple in order again. So he, he raises some funds to do a remodel of the temple. And as they're remodeling the temple, they find something. This is an amazing story. You know what they find? They find, I'll just say, they find the Word of God. Here's what that's like. We're going to do a big remodel of the church, and all of a sudden we stumble across the Bible. It's like, what is this? And that's how it was. They stumble across the word of God that they had at that time, and everybody says, what is this? Imagine that. God's word through all of those bad kings had become so distant they actually lost it somewhere. So they bring it to young King Josiah, and I love what he did. Look at this in 2 Kings 22. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he what? He tore his clothes. Why did he tear his clothes? Because he recognized they were so far from what the Word of God said. He was grieved. He was mourning. He was, he was devastated by the fact that they were so far from the Word of God. And then the king commanded Hilkiah the priest and Akram the son of Japham and Akbor the son of Melchiah. I don't know if I'm saying those right the scribe and, and all these other guys. And here's verse 13. Go inquire of the Lord for me and the people in all Judea concerning the words of this book that have been, been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that burns against us. Why? Because our fathers have not listened to the words of this book. He says, we're in deep trouble now, church. Because we've gone for years not paying attention to the word of God. We need to get this right. I would say he trembled at the word of God, would you not? He trembled and says, this isn't right. He realized they haven't been following it. And as we go on to this next chapter in 2 Kings, he calls all the people together and he says, now sit down and listen. This is the word of God. We obey it. We respond appropriately. He didn't just put it on a shelf. He didn't be, put it behind some glass jar, but he read it. See, understand, God speaks for a reason. He speaks so that we will know his truth and that we would respond to his truth. And he is passionately looking for those people that will do that. who tremble at his word. Can I ask, when was the last time you actually read something in God's word and you said, oh, I'm so far from where I need to be. Where it actually, 
pierced your heart and you said, ah, oh, Lord, forgive me. God is passionate for people who are humble, who recognize their brokenness before him and will tremble at his truth as he makes it known. Who's he passionately against? Well, we see it in this passage as well. He's passionately against those who would worship God somehow superficially, ritually, uh, routinely. So it's interesting, uh, he who kills an ox is like one who would kill a man, and he who would sacrifice a lamb is like one killing a dog, and offering grain offerings is like Offering pig's blood and burning incense is like worshiping an idol. Those are interesting contrasts because those are all the things God asked his people to do. (laughs) He says, I want you to sacrifice and to offer grain offerings and to burn incense before me. But here's the deal. They were doing it, but it was heartless. It was routine. It was ritual. So notice what God says. He says, you're just not quite getting it right. Clean it up a bit. He doesn't say that. He says, when you do that, it's, it's an abomination to me. He says, it's just like killing a person. It's just like breaking a dog's neck. It's just like offering pig's blood. It's just like worshiping an idol. You understand what he's saying? He's not saying this worship is just not quite right. He says, it's an abomination to me. Now, I want to spend a whole lot of time there because this is now the third time we've covered this particular issue. Remember last week, God said, when you worship like that, it's rebellion. So I would just pray that God would keep us far from that sort of superficial ritual worship. And if you're here today somehow just because you need to be, it's just part of your system, understand that that's not just not quite right, it's an abomination to God. And it would really be better if I can say this directly, it'd really be better if you just stay home than somehow worship God in some sort of ritualistic routine that you think brings you into a proper relationship with him. So what do we see? We see the position of God high and lifted up. We see his passion, who he's passionate for and who he's passionate against. And then we see in these next verses another reference to his people. Starting in verse 8. Who has heard of such a thing? Who has seen such things? Can a land be born in one day? Can a nation be brought forth all at once? As soon as Zion travailed, she also brought forth her sons. Shall I bring to the point of birth and not give delivery, says the Lord? Or shall I, who gives delivery, shut the womb, says your God? Be joyful with Jerusalem and rejoice for her All you who love her, be exceedingly glad with her, all you who mourn over here. So here we see another reference, as we've seen it going through Isaiah, a commitment to his covenant people. God has a chosen people. He will always have the same chosen people. He will never forget his chosen people. His chosen people are the descendants of Abraham, the Jewish people to this day. And it's communicated in a very powerful way here. We see the references to Zion and to Jerusalem. Those are synonymous terms, to the land, to the nation. And we see these beautiful images of the idea of giving birth. And God asks two questions here in verse 9. Shall I bring to the point of birth and not give delivery? Second question. Or shall I who gives delivery shut the womb? What are those questions meant to communicate? What he's saying is, I will fulfill my plans for my people. The people that I chose, the people that I conceived, will come to completion in my perfect plan. Now understand, there are some people even today that have written off the people of God because they live in rejection of their Messiah, and indeed they do today. But I would exhort you to keep watching, to keep praying, to keep looking 
And what we're going to see as God plan moves to its completion is God will become more and more obviously committed to his people Israel. Now, I don't know if we'll be here to see that all happen. I would suggest that we've seen some of it happen already, even before our day, and even some now in the current conflict. But God is going to show up for his people and complete his purposes for him. And again, I don't know when, I don't know the exact time frame, but we will see more and more of his people call out to him and recognize Jesus as their Messiah. I don't have time to connect this all together, but I just want to read one passage from Revelation 12 that uses some of the same images that communicates how God is going to show up for his people. Again, I'll just read this. We won't unpack it all. And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman, Israel, who gave birth to the male child, Jesus. But the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished for a time and times and half a time. From the present of the serpent. And the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman, so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river which the dragon poured out of his mouth. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who kept the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. There's beautiful images there. There's a beautiful communication in all of those images that God will sustain his people all the way up to the end. We need to anticipate it. We need to look for it. While we are not his chosen people, we have been blessed to be grafted in to the blessing of his people. And church, can I remind all of us that we have great blessing as we continue to support and pray for his people. As we move through this passage, we also see a very clear reference to the glory of our God. Starting in verse 18. For I know their works and their thoughts. The time is coming to gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. I will set a sign among them, and they will send survivors from them to the nations, Tarshish, Hut, and Lud, Meshish, Tubal, Javan, to the distant coastlands that have neither heard my fame nor seen my glory, and they will declare my glory among the nations." I want you to notice in that verse with all the strange references, the missionary heart of God. Notice the reference to all the nations, to all the tongues, to all the land. So why does God want the gospel to go to all the people? Why does God want the good news to be translated into every language? Why does God want us as a church family to be, continue to send teams to India to be involved in this huge missionary endeavor that he has started? Why? One answer to that, because God wants people to be saved, is that the right answer? Okay, I can go with that. He does want people to come to a knowledge of, of the truth and be saved. Certainly that is the end result, but there's something bigger. There's something grander. There's something even more important. There's a bigger reason and even more significant reason. God wants the gospel to go to all people so that he is glorified among all people. God wants the good news in every language so that God is glorified and worshiped in all languages. Understand that Jesus Christ came, certainly, to see people saved, but even in a bigger reason, Jesus Christ came so that God would be glorified in an even a greater way. Look at this passage in Romans 15. 
For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs, verse 9, so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. And so when we go back to Isaiah 66, we find out that the big picture of all that God is doing is so that he would receive glory, that he would receive honor, so that he would be worshipped. So we see very clear references to see the glory, to declare his glory, to make his glory known. Church, it's important that we remember, that we remember the ultimate reason that we exist. As individuals and as a church, God is serious that he receive the glory, that he receive the attention, that he receive the honor. And he's already communicated this through Isaiah a number of times. Let me just show you those. In Isaiah 42 and 48, read those out loud with me. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. The next one, for my own sake, for my own sake I will act, for how can my name be profaned and my glory I will not give to another. Sounds a bit egotistical, doesn't it? No, it's not egotistical. For God to give his glory or to his attention to any other being would not only be a dishonor to himself, it would be harmful to those other people. If God is the only good, holy, and perfect being in the universe, then to make him known, to make his glory known, to make his truth known is the ultimate purpose. Amen? To declare his worship, to declare his name, that's the ultimate purpose in all that we do. And in that, people are saved, and in that, people grow and in that good things happen but all those good things and all those people being saved it's all for a bigger purpose for the glory and the the honor of God himself every week when um, or I should say every month when our elders and deacons meet you can ask them that almost without fail we start our meetings with this question so why are we here again So we start out all the time asking, why are we meeting again to talk about all this church stuff? And if we can't answer that question well, then really the meeting is a waste of time. Why are we meeting again, I ask them. And we've captured the reason we even meet here today in our church family, in in what the Bible says. We exist. We meet today for the glory of God. That's why we're here. That's why we've been created. Now in our church, we've said we need to be reaching out with the gospel. We need to build up through the word. We need to grow strong in our relationships with one another. All of those are good things that are to do one big thing, and what's that? Bring glory to God. As we do all those things well, the ultimate end is accomplished in that God is known and God is pleased and God is praised. So as Isaiah 66 brings the message of Isaiah to an end, it would be expected that he's reminding his people again that you exist for my glory and in the end my glory will be seen more and more and more on the planet. And church, if we can keep that in mind, that huge, wonderful purpose, then, then it keeps us above the challenges. It keeps us above the disappointments. It keeps us above the discouragements. It keeps us on the high plane, on the noble purpose. This passage, the book of Isaiah, ends, I thought, in a real interesting way. It ends highlighting and emphasizing the judgment of God. So let's go to the end. Verse 22. For just as the new heavens and the new earth which I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so your offspring and your name will endure. Again, referring to his people. And it shall be from new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all mankind will come to bow down before me, says the Lord. 
Then they will go forth and look on the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me. For their worm will not die, and their fire will not be quenched. And they will be an abhorrence to all mankind. So we see a reference to the new heavens, the new earth. Again, we could go to the book of Revelation, and we can see that that's that's how it ends. God creates fresh, new, the new heavens and the new earth. And so we see the completion of his plan. We also see the completion of his plan through his people as People will bow down before him, but I want you to notice where it ends because not all people will bow down before him. Verse 25 actually ends on a very serious and a very somber note. Look at it again. And they will go forth and look on the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me, for their worm will not die and their fire will not be quenched and they will be an abhorrence to all mankind. Now that verse is significant in a number of reasons. First of all, that's the verse that Jesus quotes when he refers to what in the New Testament is referenced as hell. So in Mark chapter 9, here's what Jesus says. If your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell where, and here's the quote, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So Jesus, obviously knowing the Old Testament, grabs that phrase and brings in current and he's telling the people this hell is a terrible place and it's to be avoided. And it would be better, as he says there, to go into the kingdom of God with only one eye. So Jesus grabs that phrase from Isaiah and he brings it current. He's saying this is, this, is, this is an eternal perspective as he applies it. But it's also an interesting verse, verse 24, because it talks about the people seeing the corpses of those who have transgressed against God. So it could be, as I've tried to sort that out, it could be that this might be one of those passages where Isaiah is saying it's now and then yet there's a future perspective because as history progressed and even Isaiah's time, those that transgressed before God and God brought them low, they would see that. But yet there's a sense of future where this becomes even an eternal reality. The big takeaway from the way this book ends is this, so that we don't get lost in the weeds here. The big takeaway of this is that no one should take lightly the seriousness of God's judgment. We've discussed a number of times to the church families is that the beauty of God is that he's not just one-dimensional. And again, in our, in our, in our desire to somehow capture God, we try to make him one-dimensional, and it seems like the most popular dimension that we want to put God in is God is a God of love. Is that true? It certainly is. But is that all he is? No. See, that's the one dimension that people want to put him in. God is just a God of love, and that's all you need to know. No, we need to know God is a God of love. We also need to know all the other dimensions, and particularly that God is a God of justice. And those two beautifully meet at the cross of Jesus Christ. God is a God of love, but he's also a God that is holy. He is also a God that brings justice and brings judgment. Understand, God cannot and never has been able to turn a blind eye to sin whenever it's present. He always responds to it in an appropriate, just way. And God has ultimately made a provision for the sin of people through Jesus Christ. Amen? That's the whole message of the Bible. It's what Isaiah looked to. It's what we look back to. And yet for those who reject the provision of God, those who reject the loving provision of God are only left to experience the justice and judgment of God. 
So if we're to learn how to live life well, as God intended, we must see the fullness of God, his love and his justice, his grace and his judgment. If we're to learn to live life well, as God intended, we must see the cross as the crux of how God brings those two dimensions of his character together. It's at the cross where God's love and justice meets. It's the cross that Isaiah looked forward to. Remember when we covered Isaiah 53? It was the message of the cross. It's the cross that we look back to now. It was the work of Christ on the cross that will carry us into the future. So it's interesting that this whole book of Isaiah ends on this very somber and serious note, and I hope it doesn't get lost on any of us. That God in his great love is also a God of great holiness, and judgment does come. Judgment does come. My prayer is that as you hear that again, if you're here today, and somehow the message of the cross is still just theoretical and it's not personal to you, that you would cry out to Jesus Christ, that you would call out to him for your salvation even today. So what might be the next steps appropriate to this time that we've spent in the book of Isaiah. Well, one I've just mentioned, that you would call out to Christ, that he would save you even today. But secondly, maybe for the rest of us that already know Christ in a very personal way, seriously ask this question. Has my walk with the Lord become cold and lifeless and routine? Have I brought God down to a manageable level that allows me to remain very, very comfortable? Or am I allowing the bigness and vastness of God to invade me so that he's moving me into areas that are new and fresh? Ask yourself the question, please, right now in your life, at this season of your life, how is it that the Lord wants you to worship him more fully, more passionately? How is it that the Lord wants you to serve him in his kingdom right now in this day? Maybe it's not, and can I say probably it's not just the same old way that you've always done it. May God stir us up to see his vastness that we would be wrapped up in that in our world even today. Would you bow your heads with me right now, please? As I pray, I'm going to pray a prayer written by a saint many years ago. May it be true for all of us. Disturb us, Lord, when we are too well pleased with ourselves, when our dreams have come true because we have dreamed too little, when we arrived safely because we sailed too close to the shore. Disturb us today, Lord, when the abundance of things we possess have caused us to lose our thirst for you, for the waters of life, and having fallen in love with life, we have ceased to dream of eternity, and in our efforts to build your kingdom here today. We have allowed our vision of the new heaven to dim us, or to dim in light of what we have today. Disturb us, Lord, to dare more boldly, to venture on wider seas where storms will show your mastery, where losing sight of land, we shall see you more clearly. Amen.